Good morning. I'm Michelle Lavander, Director of the Center for Health Journalism at the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Today we'll be tackling a fundamental question in healthcare. Can transparency improve quality? This webinar is part of our Health Matters series, which is offered thanks to a generous grant from the National Institute of Healthcare Management Foundation. Advocates have long argued that efforts to improve the quality of healthcare by making doctor ratings and hospital rankings public should help to make care better, but such efforts have had mixed success. In this webinar, we'll explore the reasons for that less than stellar record and look at some of the encouraging case studies that offer clues to the potential of this movement. We'll hear from two distinguished speakers who have tackled this knotty question from distinct disciplines, healthcare program design and investigative journalism. As New York State Commissioner of Health, Dr. Nirav Shah established a reputation as an advocate for improving healthcare quality through transparency. He published performance indicators for all New York State cardiologists, a controversial step that prompted changes in practices and quality scores. Now, as Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for Clinical Operations for Kaiser Permanente in Southern California, he's nudging doctors to improve care by sharing performance data in-house. The next step? Could it be that Kaiser will share such information with the public? Marshall Allen, meanwhile, has helped carve out a unique role for journalism in gathering public records on doctor performance and sharing them with the public. As a staff writer for ProPublica, where he reports on patient safety, he's one of the, cre co the creators of ProPublica's Surgeon Scorecard, which published the complication rates for about 17,000 surgeons who perform eight common elective procedures. He also moderates the ProPublica Patient Safety Facebook group. Allen's work has been honored with several awards, including the Harvard Kennedy School's 2011 Goldsmith Prize for Investigative Reporting. He was also a Pulitzer Prize finalist for local reporting. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few operating procedures. We'll hear first from all of our speakers, then we'll open it up to your questions for the final 20 minutes of our hour. Because we have several hundred people participating in the webinar, we'll ask you to comment in the question field in your control panel, and we'll read out your questions. If you have technical challenges, please also text us through the question or comment field in your control panel. You can tweet about this webinar at hashtag transparency. We will be live tweeting it at Reporting Health, and we will also be archiving this on our website, centerforhealthjournalism.org. Well, let's get started. Dr. Shaw, what works? What doesn't and why in this in this transparency effort? Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak with this great group. Um, I'll start with a little story around what works and what, what worked about it, and then we can go on to some of the other parts of your question. Uh, back in 2011, in the state of New York, um, cardiologists were all trying to do the right thing for their patients, but weren't always achieving that outcome. In fact, Nearly one quarter of all percutaneous coronary interventions, which is a long word for blowing up balloons in the arteries around a patient's heart to open up blockages, fully 23% were being done inappropriately according to the data that we had at the State Health Department. And this was inappropriate according to the cardiologist's own guidelines. The American College of Cardiology said only after there's a certain blockage should you blow up this balloon and open it up? Um, when we saw that, we were appalled. And we said, what's going on here? Um, well, let's start by releasing the data to the physicians themselves and ultimately to all patients. And when you release data that shows that something bad is happening, uh, obviously this is a life-saving procedure for patients who need it, but if you don't need it according to guidelines, you could have bleeding, infection, and even have death as a result of inappropriate uh, percutaneous coronary interventions. So when we said we were going to release the data, the cardiologists, of course, complained. My patients are sicker. The data are wrong. This will cause fear and confusion among all the patients. Uh, and you're doing a great disservice by releasing data. Um, certainly, we had our own opinions about this, and we went ahead and started by releasing the data first to the physicians themselves, so they could see how they performed relative to every other cardiologist across the state of New York. And what happened? Well, it actually made a big difference. That 23% inappropriate rate went down 
to 8% inappropriate, according to all of the standard guidelines, no changes, in about 18 months. And all we did was release the data. Obviously, what happened was that physicians who were interested in this work were actually finding that it was them who had opportunities to improve. And as a result, we were able to change through peer behavior alone the opportunities for improvement. This allowed us to um, ultimately release all of the data publicly. By the time we got to that, it had already seen the improvements. We had already seen the improvements across the state of New York. And it changed culture. One of the hardest things to do in healthcare and in medicine is to change physician culture. The power of transparency, even not full transparency to the public, incremental transparency among peers has made a big difference. So today you can go on to healthdata.ny.gov and see the names of the physicians who have performed inappropriate or lower than standard care. I don't think many patients are going online to do that, but it's all there and it's continuing to drive improvement across the whole system, across the state actually. That kind of transparency to the physician level related to outcomes that matter is really powerful. And that's been one of the primary tactics that Kaiser Permanente has used over time to drive improvement to the highest level. It's focusing on metrics that matter to transform care. Let me give you an example. The average hip replacement surgery in America requires a hospital stay of anywhere between three and five days. But if you happen to be a member of Kaiser Permanente and uh, admitted to our Downey Medical Center, up to half of our hip replacement patients can go home the very same day. How is that possible? Do you even want to go home after having such a big surgery? And the resounding answer from our patients is absolutely we want to go home. We want us to have the care around my terms as a patient as opposed to around your terms as a doctor. When we have patients in the hospital for days on end, it's really about the convenience of physicians being able to round, about us being able to draw tests. The actual care you get can be measured in a few minutes or maybe half an hour per day in the hospital in terms of hands on the patient. And so if you consider that as a, the standard of care and you blow up the model, how do, you, how do you actually blow up the model? Well, you become radically transparent about every step of the process to everyone else on the team. When you talk to the anesthesiologist, there is actually a better way to do a block for surgery. You do an anterior block on the hip, and that means the patient has no pain, but has a sensation that allows the patient to walk around. So why do we allow other variations other than the anterior block? I don't have a good answer. And when you're transparent, people quickly move to the best practice. The same thing. How many devices are used today in a hip replacement? Well, every surgeon has their favorite one. You could have a dozen different devices which require a dozen different trays, a dozen different ways to learn around a workflow in the OR for a given device with marginal, if any, benefits from one device to the next. And the data will show that probably you only need two or three devices. And when you have only two or three devices, the team workflows improve, safety goes up, quality goes up, and ultimately that standardization allows innovation. So when we have a patient who comes in for a hip, what we do before the hip replacement surgery even happens, we'll send a pharmacist to the home to explain any medication changes. We'll have a nurse visit the home to get rid of the rug a patient might trip on. We do patient and family education on what to expect around the surgery before the surgery even happens, like moving a bed to the first floor. We deliver walkers and canes to the home before the surgery even happens. On the day of the surgery, the first case in the morning is the hip replacement, and as soon as the patient is out of the OR, they go home, and who's waiting for you at home? Physical therapy is waiting for you at home to have your first physical therapy appointment in the home. That night before you go to sleep, 
the doctor calls you at home and says, I'm not going to go to sleep unless you can. You're going to sleep just fine at home. The next morning, physical therapy is there at 9, a nurse is there at 10. At noon, the physician reviews both notes in the electronic health record, makes any changes that are needed. At 3 p.m., you have another physical therapy appointment at home. And the next morning, an appointment in your orthopedic surgeon's outpatient office. So what is a hospital-acquired infection rate when you're recovering at home? It's zero. What are the visiting hours like at home? Much better. The patient satisfaction with food? Much better. And so what this allows us to do is to create, because we have standardized processes for everything from every single workflow around a patient's needs, we have multiple safety nets, lots of people making sure nothing is going wrong, and actually the standardization allows us to do mass customization. Everyone gets the highest standard of care, and then you customize on top of that with whatever a specific person needs. And that person is very happy with the care, and it's better care, and it's safer care, and it's the model for moving forward. It's transparency down to each individual actor's, uh, on the team's actions, allowing for standardization. And when you have these kinds of standardization and transparency, where every provider across the system knows how every other team is performing. We all want to do what's right for our patients. We will actively go and see, hey, Dr. Smith, how did you pull off that outcome for your patients? What are you doing differently? What can I learn from you? And so today, when in America, high blood pressure is controlled at a rate of 65% across the country, at Kaiser Permanente, our high blood pressure control rates are 90%. When you have a five-year survival for colorectal cancer in the country of 65%. At Kaiser Permanente, our numbers are 75% five-year survival, and we're going to half the death rate in the next three years. It's radical transparency with actionable data. So every provider is empowered to give you what you need. When I go in for my optometrist, she reminded me of my overdue cholesterol screening because that is evidence-based and it will improve my length of life more than just about everything else. I'll give you one more example. We had about 2,000 different pathways for how to treat cancer. And we put a whole bunch of our cancer specialists in a room and they came out with 400 different pathways. What that allowed us to do was to, again, standardize the care that our patients are getting at the highest levels of the evidence. And then we learned from the data. Today, the average woman enrolled in a clinical trial for cancer is 48 years old for breast cancer. At Kaiser Permanente, we saw that the average woman we were treating with breast cancer was actually 72 years old, not 48. When you're 48, you don't have many bad outcomes. You don't have things like febrile neutropenia, which is a life-threatening infection, very rarely, maybe 2%. But when, you have, when you're 72, a real-world woman getting real treatment, the rates of such bad infections happen at a rate of about 18%. Completely preventable. So we use the data to pre-treat every woman we treated for this uh, febrile neutropenia, life-threatening infection, and zeroed out the rate of febrile neutropenia, ultimately saving lives because of radical transparency around data. So we took evidence-based practice and turned it into practice-based evidence. We flipped it on its head. So if you remember, doctors always want to do the right thing, but they need actionable data at the point of care to make those differences. Peer pressure can drive behavior change and ultimately lead to the culture changes in a short amount of time. It took us 18 months to change New York State's cardiologist practice by orders of magnitude. And no regulator could otherwise achieve that. And all we did was just publish the data. That that transparency leads to task standardization. And that standardization allows for mass customization and increases the speed of high quality care. Patient time is one of the most overlooked metrics of quality. We must value time and give it back to our patients. Standardization and transparency allows us to do that.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. Marshall, we're going to turn to you, and let me ask you, what inspired you to launch your patient scorecard? How good of a job has the medical profession done in your view to transparency and quality? Well, thank you for inviting me uh, today. Um, um, it's a privilege to talk to you about our surgeon scorecard and to go into some of the details behind it. Um, we were inspired to launch the surgeon scorecard and begin this lengthy investigation because of the problem of patient harm that is an ongoing problem across the United, Spa uh, United States. Um, patients keep getting hurt. There are a lot of estimates that put patient harm as one of the leading causes of death in the United States, and the problem is kept secret, and the self-policing within the medical industry, um, generally speaking, does not work. And so patients, when they go to the doctor, when they go to get an operation done, face a real dilemma. How are they supposed to choose a surgeon? They don't have any publicly reported information to go on, even for elective procedures, for most elective procedures. And essentially the medical community is putting them in a situation where the medical community is saying, just trust us. But the problem is patient safety is worse today um, than when the famous to Ares Human Report was published 15 years ago. So we were asking ourselves, and we don't really think, I mean, has this trust been earned? I mean, the answer for us would be no. The best way forward is not more of the same. So for those of you who may not be familiar with ProPublica, we're a nonprofit investigative news organization, and our mission is to use the moral force of investigative journalism to spur reform. So when we think about healthcare transparency, we are very much coming at it um, as outsiders. Our stance is very pro-transparency, so we um, really would agree with this report that the National Patient Safety Foundation put out last year. One of the quotes they said there was, um, if transparency were a medication, it would be a blockbuster with billions of dollars in sales and accolades the world over. And as Dr. Shaw was saying, there are a lot of examples of transparency being really effective. So. When we approached the scorecard, um, which is essentially a searchable database so people can look up um, their doctor, they can look up their hospital, and I'm going to get into some of our methods and what it really contains. We, we thought about it like journalists. How many operations did a surgeon perform and how many patients suffered harm? We looked at eight common elective procedures, hip and knee replacements, spinal fusions, gallbladder removals, prostate resections, and prostate removals and the database itself contains about 17,000 surgeons. There are an enormous number of challenges um, when dealing with this type of analysis, especially from where we sit. We can only use publicly available data. We don't have the internal data that um, someone like Dr. Shaw has. So perfect data is not available. Um, what we used was Medicare billing data, and what's in that is basic information about the patient, about the hospital stay, and about the procedure but obviously we do not have complete um, clinical records. We had to account for high-risk patients, and so one way we did this was choosing the most low-risk procedures. We excluded all emergency cases. We only picked cases that are relatively low-risk, elective. We excluded cases where the patient was transferred or where the patient had the procedure because of an unusual diagnosis. And then to further risk adjust, we hired a Harvard biostatistician to guide us and the model we have accounts for patient factors and accounts for overall hospital safety. We also use the most reliable data points in this Medicare billing data. So the way we counted complications were any time a patient died in the hospital or was readmitted within 30 days for a complication related to the surgery, we consider that a complication that we would count. So doctors and frontline surgeons guided us in determining these things. And then finally, we wanted a measure that could be understood. So we wanted a single measure, what we call the adjusted complication rate, where the units are people. We didn't want to have one of these measures where it's like number of infections per thousand bed days or something like that. Those are very difficult to understand. Then we reported out the story. So we got the raw results um, about a year before the story published, and then we did the risk adjustment. And we took that data and those um, raw findings around the country. We went to 
uh, medical providers, hospital officials, researchers. We went to hospitals on the ground and surgeons on the ground. We showed them the data and we wanted to see if it reflected what they saw on the front lines. And we found that the data was very accurate. Through this whole process, we were also engaging the community for investigative reporting. So this is where we're unique compared to researchers or maybe medical insiders. We engage the public. So we, we have a ProPublica patient safety Facebook group that has almost 4,000 members in it. Um, I welcome anyone on the webinar to join. Um, that's a place where there's a daily conversation with dozens of posts and comments, mostly from the point of view of patients who have been harmed or their family members or their loved ones. We also created a questionnaire called the ProPublica Patient Harm Questionnaire. That's been completed almost 1,400 times, and that's a very detailed questionnaire to get the experience of patients who have been harmed. And then we also reached out to medical providers, doctors, nurses. We had them fill out a short questionnaire, basically opting in to be our sources and to help us with our investigation. That's been completed hundreds of times. So the sources um, uh, were coming from a lot of different stakeholder groups. For the methods, we had more than a dozen health services researchers guiding us. For clinical knowledge, we had dozens of doctors. For surgical practice, we had surgeons who did each of these procedures. Basically, with each step in each phase of the project, we were guided by um, experts in the field. So what we found was very interesting. I mean, we, we knew that we would find variation, but what surprised us was how much variation we found inside the same hospitals. As would be expected, the average complication rates were quite low for the type of complications we were identifying with these procedures. But even on low-risk elective procedures, there was major variation in surgeon performance, even within the same hospital with the same procedure. We also found some high-performing surgeons, like this gentleman on the right is Dr. Aaron Joyner. Um, he's down in Florence, Alabama. It's a community that has really poor um, public health uh, statistics, very high diabetes rate, high obesity rate, high smoking rate. And yet Dr. Joyner, according to our measures, had one of the best complication rates in the nation. There were some obvious limitations with what we were doing. We aren't looking at every case. We just had Medicare fee-for-service data. So we didn't have data for people who are not part of that program. We were also only counting certain patient safety events. We weren't able to see every type of complication that could happen to a patient. The volume wasn't always as high as what we would like because it was just Medicare patients. And also, of course, past performance doesn't guarantee future results. And the data does not say who is to blame, who caused the complication. But the American College of Surgeons and others do agree that especially for these episodic operations, surgeons are still responsible for the complications, even if they don't cause them themselves. So the scorecard has been very popular. It's been used more than 2 million times. We've had enthusiastic responses from payers, device companies, hospital CEOs, quality improvement experts. We've had lots of constructive critiques, and those are helping us improve as we work on the next version. We've had a fascinating feedback from experts. Um, I'll just look, highlight a few of these right now. This Dr. Paul Dworak was a surgeon in Minneapolis, and on the scorecard, he had one of the lowest complication rates in the country. He was pleased when I called him to talk to him about his performance, that finally the public would be able to see um, his good results. And he says, my results were very good, and other orthopedists in the Twin Cities had horseshit results and made more money. The general public never knew what the results were. He was speaking partly in the past tense because he, he just recently retired last year. Dr. John Cooper, um, Associate Medical Director uh, at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, which is a specialty group of over a thousand physicians, congratulated us um, in an email about the scorecard because he said that he has a real challenge getting data from the half a dozen non-owned hospitals where his surgeons operate. And he said he's in the process of sharing our website with his colleagues and his leadership, and he wants to leverage what we've done to help support their ongoing patient safety and quality improvement efforts. One of our fiercest critics was Dr. Peter Pronovost, who's a very well-known patient safety expert from Johns Hopkins Medicine. Um, he was one of, I would say, about a half dozen to a dozen um, researchers 
who are quite critical of the scorecard, um, looking at the um, d differences they had with methodolog method methodology choices that we made. Um, and in this blog post, um, I think it's very interesting because I think it highlights some of the culture of medicine. But he says, with the surgeon scorecard, ProPublica acted as judge and jury. They defined the measure, deemed it valid, and declared which surgeons were low quality. What assurances does the public have that such vigilante methods are, or measures are scientifically sound? And I think um, it's reflecting a certain amount of um, uh, discomfort with us coming in as outsiders and um, you know doing this type of report. Obviously, I would disagree with the way he characterized it, but we did get a, a certain amount of feedback like that. And if you Google ProPublica Surgeon Scorecard, you can see a lot of the uh, fierce blogs and critiques written in, in medical journals. Um, I like the way Dr. Ashish Jha uh, summed it up. Um, Dr. Jha was one of the experts who guided us each step of the way. There were, there were three experts like him who really we ran every decision by, made multiple visits to him, but he was an unpaid informal advisor. He described the scorecard as disruptive innovation, which he said is usually a new product that to experts looks inadequate and that's because it is. These innovations are not initially as good as what the experts use. They initially dismiss the disruptors being, part, being of poor quality but disruptive innovation takes hold because for a large chunk of consumers, the innovation is both affordable and better than the alternative. And once it takes hold, it starts to get better. And as it does, its unintended consequences will become dwarfed by its intended consequences, making the system better. That's what ProPublica has produced and that's worth celebrating. And this is where it's harder for me to quantify the effect of transparency. You know, Dr. Shaw and other um, medical providers have the inside look at how transparency is effective. I get things on the surface. I get emails. I hear from people about things that they're doing. And it definitely lights a fire under people and spurs them to improvement. But it's hard for me to tell exactly how to measure the impact of it. It works on so many levels. But so why be transparent? I mean, first of all, patients need to know and they have a right to know. We would always tell people that the scorecard is not the um, all-knowing, all omniscient, authoritative source to go for quality information about your doctor. But it's a good starting point um, to learn and to ask questions of your provider uh, for patients. And then also, it's a good starting point for medical providers to see how they compare and to um, look into cases where a doctor may have an especially high complication rate and may need to have some coaching, or perhaps a doctor has an especially low complication rate, and people could see what that physician is doing um, to have such good outcomes. Um, and as I said before, the transparency really spurs providers to improve. Um, the, the response we got from the scorecard, whether it be positive or negative, shows that when you're transparent, uh, people take notice. So Scorecard 2.0 is coming soon. Um, we're going to be iterating the process, I and mean, we're going to be adding to it in some different ways. We're going to add a measure, we think, to um, capture some inpatient harm, which we haven't done right now. We're going to put less emphasis on the categories, you know, determining who has a high, medium, or low complication rate. We're also going to put some clarifying language around what we measure, have some more precise risk adjustment, and then we're also going to try and find a way to recognize surgeons who treat more underserved patients. Uh, just some final thoughts. This is a starting point for us, not the end. It's also a starting point for transparency, not the end. Um, transparency is going to radically improve as electronic medical records um, become more um, available and also just as more organizations and, and um, whether it's people like us outside of the medical industry or people like uh, Dr. Shaw and Kaiser uh, within the medical community, there's a real demand for this among patients, and there's a real desire to get more information like this to the public. A more informed public is going to be helpful for everyone. Uh, we're also grateful for the interest in our work. I mean, even the critiques, I mean, we've had to address a lot of them. It's taken time to deal with some of them. Um, but it's been really helpful for us to hear what people think. And then we have an ongoing challenge. Uh, anytime I give one of these presentations to the medical community, 
we would love for the medical community to put us out of business. Um, you know, we didn't get into this to do surgeon scorecard for the rest of our lives. Um, it's we're a journalism organization, and this is information that we believe that the medical community has an obligation to provide to patients and to the public, and we look forward to that happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marshall and Dr. Shaw. Before we turn to, well, I just want to point out to everybody listening that this is the moment for you to send us questions through your control panel, and we can ask some of our two speakers. I was going to start out with two questions of my own directed to both of our speakers, uh, which is why have transparency initiatives had such mixed results? For instance, Hospital Compare, a major federal initiative, hasn't improved mortality outcomes. Are, are we measuring the, the right uh, things in these nascent efforts, and what would it take to make this transparency movement gain more traction? Well, I can start with that one. Um, you know, one reason we did the scorecard was because Hospital Compare, to us, didn't provide meaningful information that would be helpful to patients. Um, there, for instance, um, especially when we started this process, it was focused more on um, emergency medical cases like heart, heart attack outcome rates or process of care measures. It wasn't the kind of thing where if someone wanted to choose where they could go for a knee replacement that they could get good information. Um, some of that information is now on there, and hospital compare is uh, iterating too. Um, but I think what's been done has not been meaningful. And I, I'll add to that. I think. One, one fundamental challenge of these transparency initiatives has been to the hierarchy. Uh, you know, when doctors are in charge, surgeons are at the top of the hierarchy, and then there's way down there are the front line, the nurses, and then way, if they even appear, are the patients at the bottom of the hierarchies. And the transparency empowers everyone to take charge of their care in ways that few other things do. So that challenging of traditional hierarchies has been one reason. The second one is um, the signal to noise ratio. What what Marshall has done so well and other groups as well is you start somewhere and you iterate the data. You know, you don't have a perfect signal to noise ratio when you're working with claims data, but it's at least a signal when none existed before then. And over time that signal becomes stronger and stronger. So it's the initial poor signal that gets out there that everyone reacts to, um, not realizing that that's just the first step along a long iterative pathway that will continue to improve the signal to noise ratio. Thank you. And folks, please send us your questions through our uh, question field. I had a, another couple of questions for both of you. Uh, the University of Utah Healthcare started surveying patients about quality and then making their rankings widely public. It's gotten a lot of positive attention, uh, which would seem to suggest that these patient quality rankings could really be in indicative of quality. But then a couple of weeks ago, Becker's Healthcare found in a study, and here's the headline, hospitals with high patient experience star ratings don't have better outcomes. So, so what works and how do we make sense of these contradictions? Yeah, so I, I'm aware of that story. And what Utah did so well is they just gave unfiltered patient comments back to each physician's website. So if you search Dr. Smith, University of Utah, you'll see comments from the patient that say, the magazines were two years old, and then he injected my right shoulder when it was my left shoulder that was hurting. Things like that, unfiltered. And what that allows is it allowed doctor-patient communication to go off the charts, from being average in the country to being at the top in the country uh, using press Ganey scores uh, over a very short period of time. And there have to be good benefits from doctor-patient communication, uh, and there's other studies that show that. So that's what Utah did so well. In general, though, are those the outcomes that matter in terms of, from a patient perspective, is it uh, mortality, is it clinical outcomes that matter? Um, there is a lag between that, but they are absolutely connected. And in terms of the apparent contradictions, I was just going to say, you know, when, when different people measure things in different ways, uh, you know, they can come up with different results that can seem contradictory. Um, so, you know, we found that with what we did um, compared to what other people do with other types of data. You know, all of us are kind of looking at limited uh, pieces of, of the whole puzzle. And so it does uh, make it sometimes difficult to compare one piece to the other and see how they relate. 
Thank you. And again, for both of you, when we think about uh, building some momentum for these transparency efforts, who do you see driving this change? Is it going to come from patients and consumers or providers? Uh, you know, how does this really get some strength? Today, a lot of hospitals and healthcare organizations believe it's their data. A lot of insurance companies believe it's their data. And the reality is it's patients' data. And when we start to make that widely known and allow patients to move their data as they want and not succumb to the standards that the healthcare industry or insurance companies have held to for decades, uh, it'll really change uh, everything in, in a very short amount of time. If you look at efforts like the all-payer claims database in New York or what will come out in California, those are what Marshall's doing um, at scale across 19 million people in New York. Uh, that will be the game changers that we sh will ultimately prove the case the transparency is the standard and everything else is subpar. So the problem with patients driving the change is that the patients have um, so little power and so little unification and so little knowledge about these complexities that I just don't know if the patients are realistically ever going to be able to do it. Um, the payers on the other hand, especially the payers who have the incentive um, to uh, to care about quality, I think they're the ones who could really drive this forward. And, and by them, I think I mean like Medicare, um, you know, the state uh, Medicare, pro, uh, Medicaid programs, um, you know, they have the incentive and sort of the independence to be able to drive things forward. Um, I wish that the commercial uh, uh, insurance industry also had those incentives, but I think, um, you know, as I've talked to insurance executives, I've, I've been surprised to see how they're more interested sometimes, I think, with keeping the providers on their panel happy uh, so that they can continue to offer those providers um, to their patients. So maybe maybe Medicare and the, uh, the states uh, might be ones we can rely on. And uh, one last question before I turn to the questions from our uh, listeners here, and this one's for you, Marshall. You know, you spent uh, several years on your surgeon's scorecard uh, with colleagues. It's just a massive undertaking. So for uh, a beat reporter who covers health care, are there some ways into this um, really complex arena uh, where they can carve out some stories where, where you would urge them to look next? Definitely. Um, I, I should have mentioned earlier, my colleague Olga Pierce um, was kind of my partner hand in hand doing this whole project. Olga was really the data specialist who handled the technical side of the project. And then I did um, the, uh, the kind of in the field reporting. Um, and we both developed the methodology together, um, but I just want to make sure our roles were clear. For a local reporter, I mean, this is the kind of project that um, it was it was uh, it was diff very difficult for us to accomplish. I, I don't see too many local reporters doing exactly kind of what we did, but there is a lot of opportunity um, for local reporters to use, um, whether it's they could use the surgeon scorecard, they could use what's available on Hospital Compare. I think using the patient satisfaction scores um, are valuable. Different states, for instance, New York, um, has a lot of data available. California has a lot of data available that shows differences in performance um, at the hospital level or sometimes even at the doctor level. And so there you've had somebody do your analysis for you, and you can go out and do the on-the-ground reporting to pair it with the analysis to do some stories. Great, thanks. So we have a question here from Jillian West. One of the biggest problems around public reporting is actually convincing patients to rethink their approach to finding care. Build it and they will come definitely isn't enough here. How do we shift patients into a consumer mindset? That's a tough one. You know, we've tried. I thought uh, we built it and you could go on to the New York website and and look at a length of stay for a knee replacement and look at the cl how clean the hospital bathrooms are and how fast the return to work rates are and there's clear answers if you look at the data from one hospital to the next even in a given community but will patients even when it's spoon fed to them uh, use that? No, most times they'll just ask their doctor because they trust their doctor where should I go? And that's a big hill to overcome. I, I, I don't know how we get there. 
I think all of the, uh, getting the patient voice into this conversation as much as possible is exactly the right thing to do, but to drive individual patient decision-making behavior when they're under stress, uh, when their health is not well, to pick a doctor or pick a hospital or pick something like that is it, very hard. I don't know how to get started there. So when, when we started our project, you know, we initially were building a tool um, and doing the project with patients in mind, and we have heard from a lot of patients who use it, but I think I've probably heard from more people within the medical community who use it, um, quality improvement people in hospitals, um, insurance companies, device companies, doctors themselves. Um, I think there are two audiences for us when we do this, and the patients are obviously always going to be our first audience here at ProPublica, but the medical community is a, is a very close second um, because they actually have the sophistication to understand this information. They also really want the information. I mean, I was amazed when I would go to a hospital. They often could not tell me their readmission rates for their surgeons for these elective operations. They were only, you know, a typical community hospital around the United States is probably only keeping track of the things that Medicare publishes on Hospital Compare or the things that are used for pay for performance. So when we came to them looking at things outside of the, what the regulators look at, they didn't have an answer for us. Um, surgeons themselves I spoke to did not know their own complication rates and even if they knew their own complication rates they didn't know how they compared to other people around the country and so I think that was part of the motivation for a lot of the surgeons who helped us they saw the value in what we were doing for themselves and they wanted to contribute to it this is actually a perfect segue to one of our questions from Tinker Reddy who says, what are the challenges for smaller hospitals with fewer resources and smaller staffs that want to move toward greater transparency? You know, I'll take the start. It, you, you'll be surprised at the data that's sitting in your own servers today. Look at readmission rates uh, in, your, in your hospital by surgeon. It's probably sitting there with the surgeon's name next to it, and all you have to do is go to a surgical uh, chief's meeting and say, hey, did you see this Excel spreadsheet? That alone will drive 50% of the benefit, uh, ultimately getting it in more transparent formats, understanding what matters to the surgeons in terms of what are the metrics that matter, what are the uh, outcomes that matter, will get you further along the path. But frankly, a lot of this data exists even in your own small hospital. Uh, but you have to find the right person who has access to it and ho who knows how to use it and, and get it in a usable format to everyone else. I, I was amazed as I talked to people in hospitals around the country how afraid they were um, to even do what you're talking about there, Dr. Shah, uh, just how um, politically um, unpopular they felt it would be um, to share that data um, even internally. Um, so the public reporting is sort of like, it's such a radical idea to a lot of people, but that internal sharing um, causes people um, a lot of stress. However, all of them that did tell me that they had done it said it, it immediately had benefits. Um, these uh, surgeons um, and doctors and all providers, they want to do a good job and they see um, maybe something they can improve when they compare themselves to others and they, they get motivated to improve it. Um, thank you. Bonnie Wilson asks, have you seen any transparency results and improved outcomes in emergency services, and how has this transparency in Kaiser? Yeah, we, we have seen a lot of improvements over time. For example, um, what happens when someone presents with chest pain? Uh, it's a long wait. Many people get sent upstairs to the hospital, and the reality is even the data show that a lot of these patients who are low risk we're sending upstairs for several days in the hospital when they don't need to be there. Um, sharing that information back in real time to ER docs, caring for patients with chest pain, has fundamentally helped transform our practices. The number of patients who get the right care, which is appropriate, the right testing at the right place, has doubled or tripled since we started this simple initiative of risk stratifying based on the data that the doctor already has but may not have the time to calculate a formula in terms of the risk score. So we have all of the data. How do we present it in an actionable format in the emergency room to transform care? And this is good for patients. It's good for the bottom line. 
It's good for infection rates and across the board in emergency medicine. Chest pain is one algorithm. There's many other standardized algorithms which we're using. So um, we have a question from Carol Cronin. She says, I understand that ProPublica is working with Yelp in terms of patient reviews. Can you talk a little bit about that initiative and, and its results? Yes, that's been something my colleague Charlie Ornstein has been doing more than myself, so I can talk tangentially about it. Um, but ProPublica has some of our um, data analysis that has is now on the Yelp website. Um, and Yelp um, gives us some access to some of their reviews um, so that we can research them sort of in a, I mean, they're reviews that you could see um, online anyway, so we don't see anything that's not already public, but we have it in a format that's uh, searchable to us. Thanks. And uh, Michael Hockman asks, any particular concerns or issues to consider when thinking about transparency in the safety net? Are the relevant measures different? So with the safety net, I assume you're referring to federally qualified health centers and other public providers who focus on low-income, uh, multiracial, or other uh, more challenging populations than a, perhaps a commercial population. So Medicaid, uh, predominantly low cost or low reimbursement rates. And those patients uh, do have different challenges, but at the end of the day, their health care is the same. It should be the same. Um, it's easy to make excuses and say our patients are different so we can't accept the same standard uh, for them as Mrs. Jones who lives in a gated community or something like that, right? Uh, the reality is there are some differences, but again, with risk adjustment, there are ways to overcome some of those challenges in the data and really still drive to what's fundamentally important in terms of quality, in terms of safety. And uh, a question from James Chisholm, should hospitals publish their own outcomes data? Well, I think that would be a, a fantastic idea. Yeah, it would be, it would be nice if um, everyone could standardize some measures so that things could be compared from one facility to the next. But I think, um, you know, that would drive things in the right direction. And, and there are some who are doing that already. If you look at Northwell, the system in Long Island, they are publishing to the individual physician level uh, uh, boatloads of data. I don't know who's using it, but they're being extremely transparent. So progressive systems are already going down that path. I'm hoping we can get there uh, to the level that Northwell has already done uh, with Kaiser Permanente and others. And Janice Gilners asks, uh, she says, unfiltered communication is interesting. Does the doctor get to respond to the patient's concerns? This is related to the Utah work, I assume, and yes, um, there are very basic filters if there's uh, abusive language or otherwise, but frankly, the vast majority of the comments have been uh, laudatory, and it, it really gets to what, what happens is the doctor reads their own reviews on that public website, and they quickly change their team's behavior in real time, and so you'll see rapid improvement. Um, the, the filtering does occur, but it's minor, and I, I would refer to Dr. Vivian Lee from University of Utah and the work they've done. Press Ganey has done a lot of work in this space and uh, continue to do that with many more medical centers now. And we have a couple of questions on data sets. Uh, Jill Arnold says, any word from CNS on when Medicaid data might be as accessible as Medicare data? And Catherine Coker asks, how much data is available from patients regarding adverse outcomes from pharmaceutical medications following a surgical procedure? Marshall, you want to take that? I don't have answers to those questions. I'm sorry. Yeah, I would say that with Medicaid, it's a different challenge because it's state by state as opposed to Medicare, which is, you know, a federally run program. And uh, so there are states. Um, that are transparent around Medicaid data to date, uh, but they're a small handful. And as for the second question, I think um, I don't have a, an answer for the second question.
Um, did, you, did, you all, did you all hear that question, or was I accidentally muted? I'm sorry, I didn't hear anything. Oh, so let me try again. So this is from Amy Sheffrin, who says, discussion has identified examples where transparency drove change at, medical, at the medical practice level or among consumers. What are some examples of where transparency has been used more to inform decision makers and drive change at the government or policy level? I can give you one example. Um, we published data on the weight, the BMI, the body mass index, basically the height and weight combined, for every second grader, fourth grader, seventh grader, and eleventh grader across the state of New York um, on this public website. So you could go down on healthdata.ny.gov, you can go down to the individual school district level or even school level and see how fat the kids are from one school to the next. And so you can see why is Albany Central Schools fundamentally different from across the street? What's going on here? And so they could go into questions around what are the school lunch policies? Uh, how are they doing on uh, federal uh, meals for students? and 15 other questions based on just the simple BMI data, which had ancillary benefits on many other public policy debates at, at high level. So just for, from my perspective, we did a similar project to this in Las Vegas uh, when I was a reporter there uh, about six years ago. And um, that the transparency there was a much sort of uh, simpler hospital level version of, of what we did here at ProPublica with the scorecard. But that led to a lot of laws changing and policies changing about hospital acquired infections, about auditing the data that they collected from hospitals, um, about public reporting. Um, so that led to a number of policy changes. I think one of the values of something like um, the scorecard um, even uh, with um, the critiques it raises. You know, obviously not everyone disagrees with every single uh, method that we used, but one thing it shows is that it doesn't cause the sky to fall. You know, these worries that Dr. Shaw mentioned with the cardiology reporting, um, what, you know, my patients are sicker, um, this is going to cause rationing of care, this is going to be bad for patients, patients don't understand anyway. Um, actually, when you publicly report these things, um, there's a lot of value, and so far are the fears of the harm um, I don't think are realized. Thank you. I have a question here from Janet Heinrich. She says, can Dr. Shaw give us examples of metrics uh, that matter used at Kaiser Permanente and how do you change culture? Uh, Janet, I'm happy to email you a long list of these metrics I know uh, of your interest, but uh, I'm starting to value patient time. I'm actually su suggesting that we as a system measure how much time is spent in our hospitals by a patient, how, many how much time is spent shuttling between specialists versus the actual opportunity cost to the patient. And if we can start to optimize based on time, that can only happen if we can make the system work as a true system around a patient's needs. Um, so getting them out of, uh, out of the hospitals, getting them to the actual care whether it's in a video visit, so they don't have to drive through LA traffic to visit uh, one of our medical centers. Those are things that we can do as a system to save patients time. Those are one of the meta metrics that I would say will drive change over time. Obviously, all of the traditional quality metrics that every regulator wants, uh, we're looking at and we're optimizing. But how are we going to change behavior in big ways across the system? It's by thinking outside the box and saying, we can change this whole practice, this way of doing things. Let's admit patients to their home instead of to the hospital. If they needed admission, what would it take to get us there? We're doing that. We've done that with a few hundred patients now. What would it take to get us to several thousand or 10,000 patients admitted to the home and deliver the care they need there, which blows up the old models? And So you don't have to worry about hospital-acquired infections or everything else that you have to worry about, but you have to think differently and you have to understand the opportunities in that specific uh, part of the continuum. And um, another question um, about Kaiser, um, which is focused on, we've been talking a lot about online tools that can help with all this, but um, Jerome Liu asks about the transparency uh, mechanisms within Kaiser when it comes to a conversation between a patient and a doctor, and how, how what, what are the, the the, the preferred practices or rules that you have when it comes to disclosing 
uh, that a surgeon say is, is, is receiving funding from a device maker or, or, or those sorts of potential conflicts of interest? That's a great question, and obviously conflicts of interest are something that we take, potential conflicts of interest is something we take very seriously. Um, I can't say that today we have a checkbox on the form uh, of informed consent saying that my doctor spoke to me and re revealed any uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, that needs to happen at some point. The reality is that the, the conversation often happens with a resident or a, a team member, and so it's the team that's talking, and so some of those conversations are not necessarily the same. Uh, furthermore, as a not-for-profit, Kaiser Permanente, while we certainly may have con uh, conflicts of interest, have different conflicts, perhaps, than other organizations. But as a, as a general principle, I really uh, applaud that effort to transparently declare any potential conflicts of interest uh, with any patient on any given uh, relevant uh, procedure. And this is a question from um, Alejandra Ponce de Leon, who asks, as a designer, I'm interested in the intersection between the medical community and the consumer or patient side. Are there examples of consumer-facing groups attempting to increase transparency that are getting positive feedback from the medical community? Well, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Um, so I'm not. So I apologize if I'm if I'm not answering correctly. But I mean, we we've gotten a lot of positive response um, from the medical community, um, and so uh, I'm not sure if we fit in the category of what she's asking or not. So I apologize. There are groups like Clear Healthcare Costs, which has a Facebook page, and others that I'm aware of that are uh, more patient focused um, attempts to crowdsource data around cost for a colonoscopy or what did my copay uh, end up being for that uh, breast cancer screening that um, I may get to some of the what you're looking for. It's called clearhealthcosts.com is one uh, or dot org I believe something like that. We have a question from Kristen Gourlay saying are there plans to combine the surgeon scorecard data with price and cost data? Not at this time. And um, here's a question from Peter McManaman. Uh, there's a supply response one can expect from doctors and other clinicians. They are very competitive and do not want to be at the bottom half of any list. That is part of the reason why the New York Cardiology Information Release worked to reduce inappropriate surgeries. Only a small percentage of potential patients need to read the reviews to get the message to clinicians. They may lose potential patients when their scores are at the wrong end of the spectrum. So I guess he's more asking for a comment than a, having a question. Yeah, I can't disaggregate how much was patients talk calling doctors versus doctors feeling peer pressure and changing their behavior. But the results are, you know, 23% inappropriate down to 8% inappropriate in 18 months and uh, it's continued to improve in the last year and a half since I last looked at the data. Um, but the power of transparency, radical transparency at the individual provider level will drive behavior. Some providers dropped out. You know, those who were at the very bottom end of the scale saying it's time for me to retire. That, that was part of the solution for some. On the other hand, the vast majority just improved by asking and reaching out to uh, the positive deviants in the crowd, the ones who are doing really well and saying, how are you approaching this? What are you doing differently compared to what I'm doing? Thank you. A question here from Stephanie Innes uh, for, for both of you. She asks, uh, would transparency about so-called sentinel events be helpful for the public? And if so, who do you think is most successfully sharing this information with the public right now? I do think that's very helpful um, for the public for the reasons we mentioned. Um, I also think it's helpful for the medical community for the reasons we mentioned. Uh, when those things are publicly reported, um, they increase their focus on preventing sentinel events. One challenge is that, you know, like the OIG has done studies that have shown that very few sentinel events within hospitals are actually identified and counted through different reporting systems that require the reporting of sentinel events. Um, so I would look at that OIG study because it, it showed that very few 
um, cases where patients suffer harm are actually being tracked by the Sentinel event reporting systems. And I would take a slightly different take. I think that while Sentinel events are important, what we've talked about with data transparency has ultimately been about volume. When you have such rare events, um, there are a lot of factors that can lead up to a given Sentinel event, and it's very hard to deconstruct what it was. And more importantly, the chilling effect it'll have internally on providers trying to prevent that from ever happening again. If people start realizing this is going to go public, you go from a culture of let's talk about this openly and transparently to fix it so it never happens again to one where we're going to, it's going to be on the New York Times next, uh, in, in the next day or two. I don't know if we want to talk about this openly. And that's the reality on the ground. And so I would argue that with Sentinel events, unless it's a, um, a very clear definition, it doesn't actually add to the learning culture in healthcare, the continuous quality improvement culture, relative to many of these other data where it does improve quality. Uh, this is one where you want radical transparency within an organization so that every part of the system can work to prevent it from happening again. Obviously, these are things that are reported ultimately up, up the chain of command, but uh, direct to public may not actually help the conversation. Again, patients won't know where to look may not even know how to act on it, uh, given the rare uh, occurrence of Sentinel events. Marshall, did you want to answer that? or? Add well, sure. I would just to respond to Dr. Shaw, I mean, if, a, if an organization did have a, a pattern or a number of Sentinel events, um, I think that's valuable information for the public um, to know about. And, you know, you do hear a lot um, where providers say, well, if these things are publicly reported, people will kind of go into hiding with them, you know, they'll, they'll stop discussing them and they will, um, you know, stop reporting them and that will make things less safe. Um, I actually think that that's just assuming the worst of, of people. I mean, clearly people will be tempted to hide their mistakes um, when things go wrong, um, but it doesn't have to be a punitive process. And I, I feel like there's such a stigma um, around this subject that it, gives people an excuse not to talk about it openly and not to be transparent with it. And when people are open and when people are transparent, um, I don't think that there has been the harm um, that everyone seems to fear. So you, I, you do hear that argument of Dr. Shaw's a lot. Um, I just, I don't, I don't think that's the only side to the story. Yeah, and I agree. I think that you, you start with transparency, you will almost never go wrong. I think this probably warrants just a little more study. So um, we're going to close with more of a statement than a question, but I don't know if, if you, Marshall, or you, Dr. Shaw, wanted to reply to it. This is from Jolene Chambers, who describes herself as a patient representative uh, for the FDA for medical devices. Uh, she says, the medical device industry has blocked efforts to increase patient consumer stakeholder rights, including unique device identifiers and revision and explainer codes in CMS billing and include device warranties. I'm observing federal and state jury trials for thousands of pelvic surgical mesh and metal on metal hip failures just as it's a haphazard and does not stop the for-profit behavior and does not compensate and care for harmed patients. Uh, she then calls on, uh, on, I guess you, Marshall, to highlight the good performers and direct consumers away from the harm. I, I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on this segment of the medical industry. That, that's sort of outside of my area of uh, reporting, so I I appreciate the comment. That's interesting and something I could look into, but I'm not I'm not familiar with it myself. Yeah, and I would go one step further. We don't have a unique patient identifier in the country today. That simple act, where one number is associated with the same person, regardless of where they get their care, would be. Um, transformative in terms of not only transparency but in terms of quality and safety as well. Well, um, with that, I think we're going to close. Um, I want to thank our distinguished panelists and I want to thank our audience for their good questions and just remind you that this will be archived on our site, centerforhealthjournalism.org. And um, if you have a moment, fill in the evaluation that we'll send you. It'll take five minutes so that we can help design uh, webinars that are most useful to you. Thank you again. Thank you.